the guided missile frigate is a completely new class designed to take advantage of the latest weapons, propulsion systems, detection and automation. The FFG is characterized by a sharply raked stem, a long and continuous superstructure, many masts and radar antennas. Forward, she carries a dual-purpose missile launcher for anti-air or anti-ship. Aft, a helicopter flight deck and hangars for two aircraft. The largest naval combatant class since World War II, the lead ship is named for the hero of another war, Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry, victor at Lake Erie in the War of 1812. A primary Navy mission is to ensure the safe transit of both military and civilian ships. The task of escorting aircraft carriers and fast, high-priority merchant ships belongs to cruisers and destroyers. Their sophisticated weapons and electronic systems permit them to operate in high-threat areas where the enemy can be expected to concentrate large numbers of aircraft, surface ships, and submarines. But a growing threat from hostile ships and aircraft armed with anti-ship missiles requires a new type of vessel, one with relatively simple weapons and electronics to counter the missile threat to open ocean convoys while retaining a strong anti-submarine capability. The Navy also needed new ships to take over from World War II destroyers as they retired from the active fleet. This requirement for a new class of ship to be built as quickly as possible provided an opportunity to apply a different philosophy in naval procurement. One shipyard called the Lead Yard would be given a contract to prepare detailed designs working closely with Nav C. That shipyard also would construct the first or lead ship. Contracts for follow-on ships would then be offered on a competitive basis to other shipyards as well as to the lead yard. Contracts would be awarded for blocks of ships rather than individual ships. Why? There was an urgent need to replace aging destroyers. And no single shipyard could construct all the ships within the necessary time frame. Once a yard had contracted to build a number of ships, it could modernize its facilities, since capital costs would be spread over many ships. Subsystems and related equipment could be purchased more cheaply when ordered in large numbers. And with growing experience, labor efficiency would improve. Because of its reputation for high quality ships of medium size, Bath Ironworks of Bath, Maine, was selected as the lead yard. Contracts for follow-on ships, based on competitive bids, later were awarded to two Todd Pacific shipyards, one at Seattle, Washington, and the other at San Pedro, California. Bath Ironworks also received a follow-on ship contract. The ship design was guided by three absolute limitations. First, a strict limit on the average cost of the follow-on ships, measured in 1973 dollars. Second, an absolute limit on full load ship displacement. And third, a limit on total accommodations. Naturally, these limitations conflicted. Reduced manning by automation, for example, adds to weight and cost. Reducing weight by using lighter materials increases the cost. Reducing cost by eliminating labor-saving machinery means additional personnel to man the ship. Combat system and communications equipment is government furnished. Other major items centrally procured by the lead yard and then furnished to the follow-on yard as government furnished equipment include gas turbines, main reduction gears, and diesel generator sets. Other major mechanical and electrical equipment is standard option equipment procured directly by the follow-on yards. To achieve this standardization, it was necessary to freeze a particular design for a given block of ships. Modular construction also reduces cost. 
Various sections, usually 16 in all, are built in different parts of the yard, then brought together at the launch site in a carefully ordered sequence. Each module can be outfitted in advance, with everything from wiring to pumps, ladders to ventilators. With much of the fitting out already done, the ships go into service sooner. Each shipyard launches at different levels of completion. New contracts, however, are amended to take advantage of new developments. Earlier ships are backfitted. The maintenance concept for the new class also is innovative and cost-effective. Parts are replaced on a regular schedule based on the predicted failure rate. When a part does fail, the entire module is replaced and sent to a depot for repair or rework. The result is a simple design, austere and relatively small, economical both to build and to operate. In 1970, the Department of Defense instituted a new procurement policy popularly known as Fly Before Buy. Stated simply, the services must develop and demonstrate a weapon system by actual tests prior to the commitment of major funds for production. Because of the time factor, it was decided that two of the frigate's main systems, the propulsion system and the combat system, would be tested at land-based test sites. Otherwise, testing could not begin until the lead ship was completed, a loss of at least two years. At Islip, New York, the Sperry Rand Corporation installed a full-scale mock-up of the entire Mark 92 fire control system. Exhaustive tests were made of the various command and decision subsystems, fire control, radar displays, computers, and peripheral equipment. Other combat systems were tested at sea aboard naval vessels. The task of evaluating the propulsion plant went to the Naval Ship Engineering Center in Philadelphia. In every department, the design of the FFG class was guided by the Navy's minimum manning concept. This is achieved largely by reducing the number of watch standards. On the bridge, for example, the ship control console resembles an aircraft cockpit. One man steers the ship and operates the throttle. The crew required is about 25% smaller than on older ships of comparable size. Retractable auxiliary propulsion units are located in the hull directly under the bridge. They are lowered when needed for precision maneuvering and provide get home power in case of damage to the main propulsion system. In the engineering spaces, the main propulsion system, the electrical plant, are operated from a central control station. Many tasks now are automated. Engine and propeller pitch settings are computer controlled for maximum efficiency and fuel economy. The automatic bell recorder records every change of speed ordered from the bridge. An automatic data logger provides a readout of such engine parameters as temperatures, pressures, and fuel levels. Thanks to such innovations, only four or five men are needed on watch, compared to 10 to 15 men on steam-powered frigates. The Perry class is an all-electric ship. Electricity from four 1,000-kilowatt diesel generators operates weapons and sensors, heating and air conditioning, automatic controls, and other equipment. Generators are remotely controlled. If a generator fails, another automatically takes its place. During combat or in an emergency, the damage control assistant monitors the fire system and the associated electrical and ventilator systems. From the damage control console, he can close remotely operated fire doors, open and close valves in the main fire system, and light off halon fire extinguishers in the main engineering spaces. The gas turbine engines allow the propulsion system to be online and ready in less than 10 minutes, compared to four hours for steam-powered vessels. Despite their enormous power, 
the gas turbines are economical to operate, consuming less fuel than conventional steam turbines of comparable horsepower. The computerized variable pitch propeller can bring the ship from a dead stop to full power in half a minute. With pitch reversed, the ship can go from full speed to dead stop in about 60 seconds. Since both auxiliary propulsion units rotate independently through a full 360 degrees, they act like bow thrusters. Tug assistance is rarely needed, even in tight berths. Although they are relatively small and compact, the frigates are one of the Navy's most habitable ships. All living and workspaces are air-conditioned. With machinery spaces well aft, Birthing and dining are amidships, the most comfortable part of the ship. Living areas have separate dressing, toilet, and lounge spaces. A well-equipped central galley serves the enlisted mess, CPO dining room, and wardroom. Dining areas permit immediate seating. The ship has a store and barber shop what used to be called the ship's office is now known as the central office complex. In this area, all administrative supply and support functions are under one roof. Complete with microfiche readers and a large library of blueprints and technical publications. As in all fighting ships, the combat information center is the nerve center of the entire vessel. Here, a computerized command and decision system is integrated with the ship's sensor and weapons. Computers quickly evaluate potential threats detected by radar, sonar, and other shipboard detectors. The Mark 92 fire control system, an adaptation of a Dutch design, combines search, detection, and multi-channel tracking of both air and surface targets. From the CIC, it controls both the standard anti-air missiles and the 76mm gun. The missile launcher, Mark 13, Mod 4, launches either the standard anti-aircraft missile or the Harpoon anti-ship missile. Guided by radar, standard is effective against aircraft or large missiles at a range of more than 15 miles. Harpoon is a homing weapon for use against enemy ships at a distance of more than 60 miles. Both missiles are about 15 feet long and can be mixed in the magazine beneath the launcher. The 76mm Otto Malera gun is an Italian design, automatically loaded and controlled. A circular magazine holds 80 rounds. The gun can fire single rounds or automatically at a rate of from 10 to 80 rounds a minute. The frigate uses a combination of defensive measures against incoming anti-ship missiles. The radar-controlled gun, electronic warfare to detect hostile electronic transmissions, chaff mortars that disperse a cloud of reflective strips, confusing radar and throwing a missile off course, and a close-in weapon system, the Vulcan Phalanx Gatling-type gun. A closed-loop radar system tracks the target, adjusts aim, and opens fire. The gun's six rotating barrels spit out 20-millimeter bullets at a rate of several thousand per minute, throwing up a curtain of lead in front of the missile. Against enemy submarines, the Perry-class frigates use the light airborne multi-purpose system, LAMPS. The main components are the ship, two Seahawk helicopters housed in hangars adjacent to the flight deck, and the communications data link. Each helicopter has a three-man crew, the pilot, 
the co-pilot and airborne tactical officer, and the sensor operator. The latter operates three separate sensors. Radar, to detect surface targets, such as periscopes. Magnetic gear, to detect changes in the local magnetic field produced by the sub's hull. And acoustic sonovoids. These are dropped in the vicinity of the submarine, allowing trackers to vector in on the target. When a submarine alert is sounded, the helicopter heads for the indicated location. Aboard ship, the aviation tactical control officer assumes control of the hunt and attack, directing the course and actuating release of the sonovoids. Acoustic data from the sonovoids are displayed simultaneously aboard the helicopter and in the ship's sonar control room. Acoustic and magnetic summary data are displayed in the CIC at the ATACO display. When signals from the sensors show the helicopter has reached the target, it drops one or more Mark 46 torpedoes. If necessary, the helicopter can carry out the mission on its own. A helicopter landing at sea in rough weather or at night is always tricky, especially on a small ship. To make it safer, the frigate has a rapid haul down and traversing system called RAST. When the aircraft is ready to land, a messenger is lowered and hooked onto the recovery assist cable. The cable is then pulled up to the aircraft where it locks onto a probe beneath the fuselage. 4,000 pounds of tension are applied to assist the helicopter to the deck. A rapid securing device locks onto the probe. The helicopter is automatically towed along a track into either of the two hangars. The Oliver Hazard Perry class is not only a unique type of ship, but also a successful demonstration of a new philosophy of naval procurement and development. Performance has been so impressive that four have been purchased by the Royal Australian Navy, further reducing our own unit cost. The ships are being built within budget and within schedule, a tribute to those who planned this class so carefully. The sharp, trim silhouette of this outstanding frigate, largest new class of ship in the Navy, will soon be familiar to sailors everywhere, not only in the United States, but in ports around the world. <laughs>